employment rate. They are going to have a revised TARP. That's the bailout plan for anybody outside of Washington who or New York who doesn't get the language. They have $350 billion more to spend, and they've made clear they're going to have to come back for billions and billions more down the road. What can they do? Because when you go to those small towns, people think that money is not coming my way. And we are told that in this new plan, they say more transparency. They say more of a focus on housing to help the financial institutions. But they also say no requirement that banks lend the money. Be Treasury Secretary for a minute. What would Jack Welch do? Jack Welch is not good enough. And we have Geithner and we have Summers there to get, give us the, the perfect answer. I think that we've got to take these toxic a a assets and foreclosures and deal with both of them. In foreclosures, there are five suggestions out there, and I'm not sure wh which one is best. But we got to take action on that because we've got to stop the house price slide. On, on the question of, of the toxic assets, I favor a guarantee or insurance plan keeping the assets on the bank's books so the banks work them out. And, and, with, and I don't agree with forcing lending. We've done that before and we end up with some of the mess we have. I think you, you can't give people mo money and then say make a bad loan. But on the other hand, if we take these bad assets, put, put a backstop, we don't put cash in, we put a government guarantee behind it, we don't spend zillions of dollars until they go bad, and we give incentives to the bankers to work it out to get so they don't take those loans from us, those guarantees. So I, you know, but I'm not the expert. We have two, the nice thing is, we have two very good people here. And I think the president Monday night can talk about these two very, very good people who both will put their best brains together and come up with a plan. But that plan, John, is a thousand times more important than all this stimulus discussion, whether it's 819, 820, 821, that's all politics. That's not jobs. But that's where I come out. I think the president would like to think it's not all politics. There's some jobs in there. But Jack Wells, what do you say to Republicans who say, you know what, we can't afford all this deficit spending. If a bank's in a bad strait, let it fail. I think get the most pragmatic deal we can get. The president won the election. His party won the ele election. Hopefully he will play a centrist role and bring an all of us together to solve this incredible problem that in my 40 years in business, I've never seen one as big, but he's got the tools and the support of the country. Grab it and fix this thing. Jack Welch. Proposal. Let me tell the American people that the vote tonight on a proposal supported by all the Democrats and two Republicans is the farthest thing from a compromise proposal. In fact, legislation. Now, what we're talking about here is Two out of 535 in the United States Congress, and both this cannot be considered by anyone to be uh, to be bipartisan. Pell grants. Now, Pell grants mean means that students who have graduated from high school can go to college. Uh, they're not getting a job. They're not going out into the workplace. The teachers who are teaching them already have jobs teaching. I don't know where the jobs are created here. My point is twofold. It is a worthwhile program. We do it every year as part of the regular appropriation process. Why is it included in this bill as if it's going to stimulate something, as if it's going to create new jobs? It's not a stimulus. We do it every year. It's not a targeted investment strategically based on what yields the highest rate of return from the economy. It's sending kids to college, which of course is a good thing, but it shouldn't be part of the stimulus package. The stimulus package, with regard to spending, is supposed to identify those things that are going to require a lot of people to go to work and therefore get hired on to do jobs. But this is an example of the kind of thing that isn't targeted strategically to achieve that objective. Uh, another item was uh, six billion dollars for special ed. Now, Special education is a good thing. We appropriate money for it every year in the regular appropriation process. Why is it in this bill? There are still so many things in this bill that are wasteful, and time doesn't permit getting into all of it. But let, let me just note some of the things that we had talked about originally that I thought at least the people who made this deal would want to cut out uh, to avoid the embarrassment that they didn't do it. But 
it appears that these things are still in the bill, just to mention a few. The transition to digital uh, uh, TV, I, I'm not sure how that creates jobs. Uh, there's another $300 million for federal government cars. Uh, that may help the auto companies, I guess. There's money for Amtrak, a billion dollars for the census, green cars for the military, the Filipino veterans of World War II in the Philippines, uh, as I said. None of these things create jobs. They may I wonder sometimes whether anyone really knows what exactly the right medicine or the right dose of medicine is to fix what ails this economy. I confess I don't know. I know what we should recovery. They have a wish list, 19,000 so-called shovel-ready projects. The latest cliche in Washington that they have worked into the stimulus and want, they want it immediately put into the package. They say to create half a million new jobs. Well, here's a look at the $149 billion project list, their wish list. The mayor of Lincoln, Nebraska, wants a $3 million environmentally friendly clubhouse for a municipal golf course. He justifies the cost, saying the construction alone would create 54 jobs. A proposed four and a half million dollar echo park and butterfly gardens in Boynton Beach, Florida would create 50 jobs and new tennis courts in Virginia Beach, Virginia would cost 1.8 million but generate 38 jobs. Well, sounds like fun. Let's bring in Democratic strategist Michael Feldman and Terry Holt, a Republican strategist, former senior advisor to the Republican National Committee. Hi guys, uh, what do you think about clubhouses, golf courses, all sorts of recreational opportunities here? <laughs> It would be good for, the, good for the golfers in Nebraska, but probably not terribly stimulative. And I'll tell you what, Andrea, this is why public opinion is going south so fast on this stimulus bill that literally everyone, every worthy cause in town, sees this as the best opportunity uh, to get some money out of this government uh, while they can. Uh, but but it's, uh, it's really causing a lot of trouble with the American people. And I think this stimulus bill is in trouble, frankly. Number one is a very small percentage of this bill is actually stimulatory. It, this bill, we, we're addressing the wrong problem. As a physician, if you don't treat the disease and just treat the symptoms, the disease gets worse. And uh, this bill is about treating symptoms and not disease. Uh, and I doubt seriously that, I, I think this bill will probably pass, uh, but with very few Republican votes. But it's not going to be successful because it's not truly stimulative. And uh, that's the problem is we don't get a whole lot of shots at this. And to take a trillion dollars, uh, 1.3 by the time you count the interest costs with it, and not spend it out in a way that's going to actually create jobs or, or markedly stimulate the economy is very troublesome to me. Senator Coburn, help me to understand just as a taxpayer how, how things can be seen so differently. You write this morning in the Wall Street Journal that you say 90% of the bill represents one of the most egregious acts of generational theft, taxpayer money going to special interest earmarks, etc. But the president uh, is quoted just yesterday as saying that most of the programs have been criticized. They amount to less than 1% of the overall package. He's saying that 99% of it is solid. How do you explain the difference in how you, the, you two men are viewing this? Well, I have a great respect for President Obama. Uh, I don't think he's read the bill. Uh, I outlined last night on a speech on the floor for over about an hour of all the things that are in there that the average American would say are absolutely not going to do anything. Uh, look, if we don't fix the mortgage and housing problems and fix the liquidity problems, we can pass a $3 trillion bill and it's not going to do any good. We cannot get out of this by doing the same thing that got us into it, and that's borrowing money that we don't have to spend on things that we don't need. Uh, th there's another very worrisome problem with this bill is we're, we're encouraging states to act irresponsibly because they haven't lived within their own budgets and because they haven't made the hard choices like every family has to make in an economic downturn. We're going to bail out the states. The next time they have a problem, where do you think they're going to come? There's about a 350 or 400 billion dollar increase in the baseline for uh, discretionary spending that will never go away. So not only is it not stimulatory, it creates dependence. And final point.